Everyone loves a good console war. Super Nintendo vs Genesis, PS2 vs GameCube vs Xbox, no matter what era you grew up in, seeing what console would come out on top, arguing with your friends about stupid reasons why you think your console is better than their console, then secretly enjoying being able to play the games you couldn't on your console when you go over to a friend's house, it's awesome. But in recent years it seems like the console wars have kind of fallen off. If we take a look at the big three here, you've got PlayStation and Microsoft who have been rivals for the past nearly 20 years but lately it seems like Sony has just been blowing them out of the water. Nintendo has just been kind of doing their own thing for a while. They're not worried about power or graphics or even releasing their console around the same time as the other guys are. So today I wanted to take you guys back to 2005 with the start of the seventh generation of home consoles and the last great console war between the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, and the Nintendo Wii. Xbox came to the party early this generation releasing their successor to the Xbox Xbox only four years later in 2005. The Xbox 360 first released on November 22, 2005 in the United States and in Canada, with an initial cost of $399 USD and only $299 USD for the budget version of the console, called the Xbox 360 Core. With the Core, you didn't get premium features like the wireless controller and the component cables, you just got a wired controller and composite cables. Keep the prices of the Xbox 360 versions in mind, they'll be important later. Also, from now on, I'm just gonna round up the numbers to make things easier. The 360 launched with a pretty good variety of games. All of your typical sports games like NBA 2K, Madden, and FIFA. There were some racing games including Need for Speed Most Wanted, Project Gotham Racing 3, and Ridge Racer 6. And there were some shooters too like Call of Duty 2 and Quake 4 which were both previously released on PC about a month earlier and Perfect Dark Zero, a prequel to Rare's Perfect Dark which came out on the Nintendo 64 about five and a half years earlier. Microsoft Microsoft bought Rare three years earlier in 2002 and they really haven't been the same since. I have heard good things about that Viva Pinata game though. Rare developed another launch title for the 360, Cameo, Elements of Power, an interesting little title about a girl who can transform into different warriors and use their powers to fight enemies and traverse levels. Outside of Cameo, there weren't many new IPs that launched on the 360. There was Condemned Criminal Origins, a first person survival horror game developed by Monolith Productions who interestingly released another horror game only a month earlier called Fear. Condemned was not as well received as Fear, but it was good enough to get a sequel a few years later, but unfortunately for Microsoft, whereas the only console version of Condemned was on the 360, Sony managed to get the sequel on their console as well. But besides Cameo and Condemned, there wasn't anything else. Well, I guess Japan did get a party game called Every Party, bonus points for originality. Honestly, looking back, the 360 launch was kinda mid. It did have a number of games to play, but a lot of those games were already out, so it doesn't really feel as special. But hey, old games are better than no games. So the 360 ended up being quite popular. In fact, its popularity even continued after Sony released their next console, the PlayStation 3, on November 11th, 2006 in North America. Sony had dominated right out of the gate with the PlayStation 1, which won the home console war of the fifth generation of video games. Then they eviscerated the competition in the sixth generation with their PlayStation 2. So they went into the seventh generation with big shoes to fill. Unfortunately, things were a bit rocky at the start. The PlayStation 3 infamously cost $500 for the base 20 gigabyte model and a whopping $600 for the higher end 60 gigabyte model. To add insult to injury, the E3 2006 press conference that announced the price of the PS3 was infamously one of the biggest disasters in E3 history. 599 US dollars. The PS3 to this day is still one of the most expensive consoles ever released. A lot of people did still buy the console even with the high price. I remember seeing the crazy lines of people standing outside of stores when it launched, but there were definitely a lot of people who were priced out from buying the thing. And what was even worse was that even if you bought the PS3, you didn't really have a lot of games to look forward to if you got it at launch. I can't tell you one game in the North American or European PS3 launch lineup that I could look at and say, yeah, I'd pay $500 and then another $60 to play this. Even as a gun enjoyer who likes crossfire, this just ain't what you need to sell a console. The 360 didn't have a great launch either, but by the time the PS3 released, the 360 had nearly an entire year to build up a catalog of games, which made the PS3's list of games at launch look that much smaller by comparison. Resistance was a launch title that ended up becoming a successful franchise, but besides that, I mean, you've got your Call of Duty game, your sports game, your Tony Hawk game, and 
nothing that's really gonna sell a whole console, especially at that price tag. If price was a big issue, luckily Nintendo had you covered. The Nintendo Wii launched last out of the three on November 19th, 2006 in North America. The Wii was easily the weirdest console of the bunch. The Wii was far less powerful than the competition, and it wasn't even a high definition console like the others were. Instead of a proper controller, it had this strange looking remote thing with a stick that could connect to it. And these controllers had sensors inside of them that allowed a lot of games to have motion controls. By swinging the remote like a baseball bat or a golf club or a tennis racket, you could have your character in the game do the same thing. Nintendo in recent years has become well known for their consoles having gimmicks, like the Wii U's gamepad and the 3DS's stereoscopic 3D visuals. And for even longer, Nintendo has been known to do things differently than the competition. While everyone else was moving over to optical discs, Nintendo went with cartridges in the fifth generation. In the sixth generation, when Nintendo did finally switch to optical discs, they went with these little mini discs instead of these standard size CDs. So when the Wii came onto the scene with its focus on motion controls, it wasn't entirely out of the blue, but it was still really, really jarring. The Wii was undoubtedly a more casual console. The gimmicky use of motion controls, the underpowered specs, and the low cost made the console not suited for the hardcore gamers but this ended up working in Nintendo's favor because this console was a smash hit for moms. Gaming for a long time had been a pastime for boys and young men, but with consoles like the Game Boy and the Nintendo DS, Nintendo saw how profitable making more inclusive games that everyone could enjoy was. There was a gap in the market for casual games, and the Wii took advantage. The Wii was an absolute hit when it came out. The gimmicky motion controls actually proved far more intuitive and easy easy to grasp than the more complex standard controllers on previous consoles. The motion controls also allowed for a ton of fitness games on the console. I remember a lot of people getting into the system because they wanted to lose weight. Some schools and other facilities began using the Wii for health and rehabilitation reasons as well. The low price of only $250 at launch made it super competitive price wise too. And if you want to talk about bang for your buck, the Wii also came with a free game. The absolute classic that is Wii Sports sports, a collection of smaller games that showed off the potential of the Wii's motion controls. The Wii actually had a pretty interesting lineup of games at launch, like a brand new Zelda, Twilight Princess, Trauma Center Second Opinion, which was a remake of Atlas's surgery simulated on the DS, and a new Super Monkey Ball from Sega, but the star of the show was definitely Wii Sports. The Wii had a certified system seller. One of the things that I think helped the 360 early on was online play. The 360 had online multiplayer through Xbox Live. The PS3 and the Wii did have online play too, and their services were even free compared to the 360's online multiplayer, which you had to pay for. But the 360 coming out first meant Microsoft had nearly a whole year to get people to buy into their service. Keep in mind, this was a time before cross-play across different systems was the norm. So if you wanted to play games online with your friends, you'd need to have the same console as them. Chances are, by late 2006, you probably had a friend or two who already had a 360. 60 for you to play online with, whereas if you went with the PS3 or the Wii, you'd have to hope that your buddies would get one too, otherwise you'd have to play with randoms or get someone to come over to your house like it's 1996. In a way, Microsoft had established a little community, and every person that bought a 360 and Xbox Live made that community larger and more appealing to newcomers. But there was another thing that I think gave Xbox an early edge in the generation, specifically compared to the PS3. Early on in the seventh generation, one trend I noticed was that games would come out on Xbox 360 before the PlayStation 3. Bioshock, Lost Planet, and Mass Effect were three notable games that came out at least a whole year earlier on Xbox 360 than they did on PS3. Some other notable titles that were released earlier on 360 were Skate, Sonic 06, and Valve's The Orange Box, which featured three new games, Portal, Team Fortress 2, and Half-Life 2 Episode 2. I'm sure a part of this was just because a lot of these games were already in development for the 360 since it was released earlier, but another part of it is likely because the PS3 was somewhat notoriously difficult to develop for. I'm no PlayStation 3 expert, and I don't want to bore you with all the details, so long story short, the architecture of the PS3 was pretty unique, and it made making PS3 games for people who weren't intimately familiar with the system a bit difficult. While we're talking about hardware, I should bring up the most notorious hardware issue of these consoles. The 
Xbox 360 had the Red Ring of Death, a nickname for the three red lights that would come on a 360 and signify that an error had occurred, making the 360 unusable. If you got a red ring, your Xbox 360 was basically screwed and you'd have to send it back to Microsoft to get it fixed. It was a huge issue at the time, so much so that in 2007, Microsoft even offered an extended warranty for consoles that experienced the red ring of death. They'd fix the console for free and pay for shipping. I remember the red ring of death controversy caused a lot of Xbox hate, so Microsoft went full damage control mode. I don't think anyone knows how many Xbox 360s red ringed, but it was enough that it was a fairly well-known issue amongst gamers. The PS3 had a similarly named Yellow Light of Death, which rendered the console unusable, but luckily for Sony, this never blew up the same way that the Red Ring did. However, Sony did have the 2011 PSN hack, when tons of personal information on people's PlayStation accounts were compromised, and Sony ended up shutting down PSN for over three weeks. It was a huge controversy at the time that put a big stain on Sony's reputation. The Wii never really had any sort of notorious technical problem, but there was a pretty big issue that the Wii had, and that was people breaking their TVs. Oh. Nintendo started including these little jackets with the Wii remotes that made it harder for them to slip out of your hand. Early on, the 360 had a handful of major exclusives like Dead Rising, Saints Row, Halo 3, Fable 2, and Gears of War. The PS3 took a while to get going, but one of their early hits was Uncharted, developed by Naughty Dog. 2008 and especially 2009 was when Sony started to pick up. Games like Metal Gear Solid 4, Little Big Planet, and Infamous released for the PS3. Meanwhile, the Wii was amassing a ton of casual hits like Wii Play, Wii Fit, Just Dance, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, and Mario Kart Wii. Unfortunately, if you weren't into more fun for the whole family type of games, you were kind of out of luck if you had a Wii. But there were a handful of real games like Super Mario Galaxy, Punch-Out, and Metroid Prime 3. The Wii kind of had a kiddie reputation to it. Nintendo has kind of always been known as the family-friendly brand, but especially during the Wii era, Nintendo had that for kids stink to it. If the Wii was your gaming console of choice, chances are you weren't the most popular kid in school. There were a few standout mature games early on in the Wii's lifespan though, like No More Heroes, Mad World, and Silent Hill Shattered Memories, but there weren't a ton of these things. 2009 is about the halfway point of this console war. By the end of 2009, all three consoles had a decent lineup of exclusives, and there were even some changes made to make the consoles more competitive. All three consoles had price drops, but not only that, both Microsoft and Sony even released several new models of their consoles, like the Xbox 360 Elite, which was a high-end Xbox with more hard drive space, and the Xbox 360 Arcade, which replaced the Xbox 360 Core as the low-end version of the console, and it offered some new stuff like an HDMI port, a wireless controller, and a handful of free games. The PS3's new model, the PS3 Slim, was a smaller, better performing, and less expensive version of the original PS3. The Slim was a great move by Sony, since the biggest things that kept the PS3 from having more success was the high price and the lack of big exclusives. Taking a few years to bolster the PS3's library and then cutting the price with this new model helped the PS3 achieve far more success. The slim model did have the downside of not being backwards compatible with PS2 games, which did give the Xbox 360 and the Wii a leg up since they could both play games from their company's previous generation consoles. Although the PS3 still was backwards compatible with PS1 games, so you still had some old games that were available to play physically. 2010 was the turning point of this generation. The Wii craze had finally died down, the Xbox 360's lineup of new exclusive games began to seem slimmer, and after a rough start, the PS3 had finally started to look really good with exclusive games like God of War 3, Gran Turismo 5, and Heavy Rain. The biggest news of 2010 was late in the year, Sony released the PlayStation Move, and Microsoft released the Kinect. The Move was this little baton-looking controller with sensors that could detect if it was moved. The Kinect was a camera that could detect someone's movement as well. Both Sony and Microsoft released motion control peripherals in 2010. It's quite clear to see that they were
were jacking the Wii style here. The Wii did kind of fall off in the later half of the generation, but it didn't really matter because the Wii went so crazy in the first half. Microsoft and Sony obviously saw how profitable the motion control craze was, so they likely tried to capitalize off of it. At the time, I thought the PlayStation Move was basically just a Wii ripoff, so I didn't really pay it too much mind, but I remember thinking the Kinect was pretty cool. The Move and the Kinect were both actually pretty successful, but they never came anywhere near the popularity of the Wii. I think the fact that the Move and the Kinect were accessories that you had to buy in addition to the base consoles made them far less accessible than the Wii was. Another thing that I think contributed to them not performing as well was simply that the Wii was a fad. It was never something that was going to last more than a few years. Sony and Microsoft jumped onto the bandwagon a bit too late. To be fair, the PS2 did have the iToy, which was kind of like a proto Kinect, released all the way back in 2003, so it's not like Sony hadn't experimented with motion controls before. While Nintendo didn't release any sort of big new motion control accessory in 2010, what they did do was try and win back the hardcore gaming crowd with a ton of releases from different developers on the Wii this year. Donkey Kong Country Returns, Sonic Colors, Super Mario Galaxy 2, The GoldenEye Remake, Kirby's Epic Yarn, Metroid Other M. Not all of the games ended up living up to the hype, but it was an exciting time to be a Wii gamer nonetheless. Games became a whole lot more accessible in this generation because all three of the major consoles allowed you to download games off of their online storefronts. The Wii Shop Channel for the Wii, the Xbox Live Marketplace for the 360, and the PlayStation Store for the PS3. The 360 actually had quite a few indie games that were released first on its marketplace like Bastion, Super Meat Boy, and Braid. If you were trying to buy a new indie game on console, the Xbox 360 was probably your best bet. The Wii had its virtual console service on the Wii Shop, which allowed you to buy classic games originally released on old Nintendo consoles and even some games from non-Nintendo consoles. The PS3 did lose backwards compatibility with PS2 games, but they did start to include PS2 games on the PS Store, allowing you to play classic games. While while games are definitely important, the seventh generation of consoles showed that other things are important besides how good the games your console can play are. For example, the Xbox 360 and PS3 could both play CDs and DVDs, and the PS3 could even play Blu-rays. Blu-ray discs were the new form of HD media storage back then, so the fact that the PS3 could play them made it valuable as a home media device. Blu-rays could play higher resolution video, but not only that, Blu-rays had way more storage. PS3 game discs were Blu-ray while Xbox 360 game discs were DVDs, and since games were getting bigger and bigger at the time, it led to the Xbox 360 versions of some games being released on multiple discs. Another form of media that was starting to blow up at the time was streaming. Services like Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube were rising in popularity at the time, so many of these services got apps on these consoles. The PS2 proved all the way back in the early 2000s when it included DVD playback as a feature that having multimedia features on your console is a huge plus, especially for more casual consumers. The late game of the 7th generation home console war saw more exclusive games, new console models, and more price drops. In 2011, Nintendo announced their next console, the Wii U, and from that point on, it was clear that the 7th generation was coming to an end. The Wii U would release the next year in 2012, and following that in 2013, Microsoft and Sony would release their next consoles, the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 respectively. By 2017, when all three consoles were discontinued, the Wii ended up winning the generation, cracking the 100 million units sold mark, which was a pretty comfortable lead over the PS3. The PS3 hit 87 million units and managed to outsell the 360, but only by a few million units over the 360's 84 million. Going by the number of units sold, the seventh generation was actually a really successful one all around. All three of the major home consoles sold well. This generation might be one of the greatest console wars ever because of how close it was. If you look at things historically, a lot of console generations were big blowouts. The PS1 dominated the fifth generation. The PS2 decimated the competition in the sixth generation. The most recent generations are kind of weird because in terms of current consoles, the Switch is easily the most successful, but the Switch is odd because it's kind of an eighth generation console along with the PS4 and 
and Xbox One, but it's also kind of a ninth generation console along with the PS5 and Xbox Series X since it was released around the halfway point of the previous two console lifespans and has existed well into the latter generation. At this point, Nintendo is just doing whatever, so if we remove them from the equation and just look at the other two, it's quite clear that Xbox has not been able to keep up with PlayStation. This was an awesome console war. While Microsoft got last place, Microsoft was still a respected competitor, and the 360 was a far bigger success than the original Xbox. Sony for once didn't have an overwhelming victory, and they even had to work to get second place in the generation. While Nintendo won the generation with the Wii, the gimmicky, kid-friendly stink to the Wii's name made it seem like it always had something to prove. I look back on this time really fondly. All the arguments back then like, oh, the 360 has better graphics. Oh, the PS3 has free online play unlike the Xbox Live. Oh, Wii games have colors other than brown. Ah, oh, fun times. This generation really felt like the last great console war. Thanks for watching y'all and have a great rest of your day.